Good afternoon, Nelly. Uh, are we ready? Thank you. So uh, this is very, very delightful to have uh, nearly a full house for our inaugural seminar series in the program in public health. There are many, many people who contribute to making this series a success, beginning with the students who attend and actually study the topics in depth and occasionally write uh, papers from the literature on the topic. But both students uh, and faculty and uh, on occasion members of our community are responsible for nominating uh, excellent speakers for the series. So as we begin this, uh, this year's program, I urge you to pay attention to topics that you'd like to hear about, uh, individuals that you'd like to have visit us. We try to make this uh, worthy of the time of the speakers so that we engage them in discussions and questions uh, during the presentation and also um, at the launch that we host afterward. We also use this uh, seminar series to build our network with uh, practitioners, researchers, uh, advocates uh, for public health. There is no better time in our country's history, in particular even uh, globally, for engaging uh, discussions in public health. We're very lucky today that the state government or the county government is not shut down like the federal government. Um, but uh, yeah, as you all know, this has been an exciting couple of weeks for health uh, in general. And a lot of the work that's done at this regional level is really what makes uh, healthcare in this country work. Uh, but we have to be very vigilant and supportive of all of the programs so that they don't uh, disintegrate. This series, as we talk today, um, we will videotape the presentation. Uh, and it's for our open courseware series. And we really have the Office of Extension, uh, the Dean of Extension, uh, Gary Martin, and uh, his staff, particularly uh, Ms. Adriana Mestas, who's back there, helping us, uh, I think, three, four years ago now that we've been uh, putting our series uh, for the world to see. And this has been very, very informative for uh, people who do not have access to the expertise that we bring to campus or to the kinds of uh, interactions that we engage in. So I um, am very grateful to the uh, extension for allowing us this opportunity. It's a privilege. Um, so as I uh, mentioned, we build networks. We also um, are very grateful for the public health agencies in our community for supporting the program in public health. And today's speaker um, really has uh, done a lot uh, in his office and in the agency that takes care of health uh, for the county population. Our speaker today is Dr. Matthew Zan. He is the medical director for the Division of Epidemiology and Assessment at the Orange County Healthcare Agency. Uh, he received his Bachelor of Science from Santa Clara University and his Doctor of Medicine from St. Louis University of Medicine. And then he did Pediatric Infectious Disease Fellowship at Children's Hospital of Colorado. He's held many, many positions since then. Uh, he's been Medical Director for the Louisville Metro Department of Public Health and Wellness. And he also was Assistant Professor of Pediatric Infectious Disease at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. He served as chair of the Immunization Advisory Work Group for the National Association of County and City Health Officials, uh, a time that just ended last year. And he currently serves on that um, organization's infectious disease work group. He's held many, many uh, multiple national public health committee, committee memberships, including the Center for Disease Control, School of Health Vaccination, Advisory Committee and the Joint 
CDC natural influenza antiviral distribution working. We're really, really delighted that he's able to join us today. Uh, he's uh, promised to stay with us for uh, lunch. So uh, if we can't finish all the questions and discussions, please join us at the end of the seminar uh, to welcome him to our program and to uh, discuss for them. For now, please join me to welcome Dr. Zion. Thank you very much, Ely, for that introduction. So, uh, so you all are, are you all undergraduates, mostly? Raise your hand, you're undergraduates. Okay. How many of you are in the School of Public Health? Yes, in the grade? Okay. So, great. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the recent hepatitis A outbreak that happened nationally, and maybe if you all pay attention to the news and the health section of the news programs, you've heard about this. And so, I'll tell you just generally, so I work at the local county health department, and our uh, epidemiology program's <coughs> job is to respond to infectious disease outbreaks. And that response locally was coordinated by people who had their MPHs, including a couple people who had their MPHs from UC Irvine. And so, as I talk through this, uh, I'm not going to ask you all questions, unless, unless you fall asleep, or for the people who came in later, I might ask them questions. I'm just kidding. Uh, so, you know, but, uh, so listen, just think this through as we're talking through this, because most of this isn't rocket science, it's common sense that we, that we use to kind of figure things out. So think about it, if you were an epidemiologist who was responding locally to an outbreak, uh, and afterwards, uh, if you have questions about how you think we, we work through this, we can talk about it, okay? So the recent outbreak was associated with pomegranate seeds, and it lasted generally from May to July of this year. So, uh, so this whole thing started on May 24th, 2013, okay? And at that time, we were informed by the State Department of Public Health, California Department of Public Health, that several states uh, somewhere near us in the western part of the country had noticed that they had had multiple cases of persons who had hepatitis A, and they had no trist history of traveling. I'll talk about traveling in a second, okay? And of that, the other notation is that several of them had shop, shopped at Costco. Now, you know, these events are all a little bit different, and I gotta admit, there's, you know, there's a little bit about this that even they did that kind of confused me a little bit, and I'll talk about that in a second. So, hepat hepatitis A virus, okay? So, 27 nanometers, so it's a tiny virus. It's a non-enveloped virus. Why do we care about that? Well, non-enveloped means it doesn't have a lipid, a fatty envelope, and the important part about that is non-enveloped viruses tend to survive on surfaces outside of uh, organisms better on you know, the environment, okay? Uh, it's an RNA virus, and that's important for us because RNA viruses habitually, as they reproduce themselves, and that's all viruses do, or that's what they exist to do. They exist to in invade an organism's cells and produce more of that virus. RNA viruses tend to make some mistakes, and what that means is genetically over time you have distinct genetic variants of RNA viruses. Um, it has, it's a pretty small, pretty simple virus, so it's that RNA, that's that long line of genetic material sitting in there. Uh, it has a viral protein, so VP is viral protein uh, that attaches to the RNA, and then it's got this capsid. So it's basically a capsule of proteins, and VP, viral protein one, viral protein two, viral protein three, those are all proteins on the surface of the virus. And the reason those proteins are important are two big reasons. One is those proteins allow the virus to attach to a cell, a human cell most of the time, and go into the cell and use that cell to make the viruses. The other part is our body's immune system recognizes those proteins, and so your and my immunity to hepatitis A has to do with whether we make antibodies against those, that viral protein one, two, and three. Okay, so one big thing to realize here, okay, is all hepatitis is not the same. So when someone comes and tells you, I've had viral hepatitis, well, I don't all mean the same thing, okay? Hepatitis A, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C are the three most common types of human hepatitis that we see. Uh, strictly speaking, the only thing they have in common is they all cause inflammation of the liver. Otherwise, B and C, uh, very genetically, completely different. B is a DNA virus, C is an RNA virus, but totally different family of viruses. And B and C generally are STDs, sexually transmitted infections, 
and IV drug use associated passage, okay? And they cause chronic disease. So, you know, when someone who's had hepatitis who's associated with IV drug use, who's got chronic long-term disease, usually it appears in your doctor, okay? Hepatitis A is passed by the fecal oral route, and we'll talk about more, that more in a bit, uh, and it doesn't cause chronic disease, and so that's terribly important. When someone says, I've been dealing with hepatitis for 10 years, it ain't hepatitis A, okay? Now, in the United States, as I mentioned, we don't see a whole heck of a lot of hepatitis A, except it's associated with travel. Now, New Mexico, they got some smart people in their health department there because they noticed that they had two cases of disease that hadn't had travel, and they jumped on it and said, there's something wrong we've got to figure out here. I don't know how they figured that out. In California, we have about 100 people each year who tell us that they didn't travel even though they had hepatitis A. Um, are they lying? Do they remember wrong? Do they just not want to tell us that they have traveled over and back? All of those are possibilities, but we have these people happen. And we had a couple of the cases that, that kind of fitting into this in the last couple of months in Orange County. They hadn't traveled, they got hepatitis A. Bothers us, but it's hard to do something, uh, you know, to be honest, totally about it. And here's the reason. Okay, so people will call us all the time at the health department and say, I ate at restaurant X and I got sick. And of course that restaurant was the one that made me sick. And that may be true, maybe not. And an awful lot of times, food illnesses, salmonella, shigella, other viral illnesses, okay? Most of those will make you sick about within a week, and a lot of times within one or two days of eating at their place. Still sometimes people get it wrong because people basically tell us, if I got diarrhea, the place that I ate four hours ago, that's the place that gave me diarrhea. Well, most of the time that's not the case, right? Uh, so following up on most of those is kind of tough, but hepatitis A is damn near impossible. The incubation period is 15 to 50 days, okay? So for the other illnesses, we try to ask them, where'd you eat Sunday, where'd you eat Monday, where'd you eat Tuesday? Well, if it could go back to 50 days, that's pretty dang a little bit hard to do. Uh, the incubation period, on average, is four weeks, okay? So gathering food history is hard. So those, I don't know who's in New Mexico's health department, but they found two people, and they managed to go back over 50 days and figure out both of them were eating at Costco. I'm terribly impressed by that. We couldn't figure that out ourselves, okay? Um, so May 31st, about a week later, okay? By that time, it was pretty clear nationally there was a problem. About 30 uh, outbreak cases had developed in all those western states that I would mentioned earlier. Uh, so one of the things we always have to do, whenever the state calls us or the CDC calls us, they say, well, we think there's something going on. We all say, okay, give us a case definition. Because if you're not really specific about what kind of person we're looking for, you know, okay, so someone who's got hepatitis A who hasn't traveled, well, for how long? You want us to go back like five years? Nah, they said, okay, go April 15th and forward. Um, and anything else? Well, hepatitis A and no travel. That was pretty much it. Now, of the 17 of these 30 group people that had been interviewed and had a report, seven, 11 out of them said Townsend Farms organic accident, berry, antioxidant berry blend was something they had purchased at Costco and eaten. Um, statistically speaking, that's pretty extraordinary. So by that point, yeah, we all kind of realized there probably, probably was associated with those berries, okay? So we called Costco, and how many people here have shopped at Costco? So everybody, kind of, right? You all at least have driven by those ginormous buildings that you have to run in. So uh, they are a national entity, and they, and you know, one thing to realize about Costco and places like that, they sell a huge amount to a huge amount of people, and so if there's a hint of a problem, they're just going to pull the product. You know, they they have, they got the dog in this on antioxidant berry. That's like 0.1 percent of their business, right? So it just isn't worth their time if there's a possible problem not to pull it. So they immediately pull the product or tell their their local stores to pull as soon as there's a problem. Uh, in, in California, six cases fit into this event and three persons uh, uh, had been in Orange County uh, who fit into the of these 17. I'll talk a little bit more about their history. Okay, so he hepatitis A, all right? So hepatitis A is a little bit funny. So this is a 2005 last uh, CDC time they, they put together the data around the world, but it's pretty similar now. Um, in terms of endemicity, high rates of, of infection with the virus, the developing world, South America, Africa, and Southeast Asia, there's a tremendous amount of, of hepatitis A virus floating around, okay? Um, if you look at the United States, 
we're kind of medium to low in the amounts of disease we've had. So of course, hepatitis A is a big problem worldwide, right? In the, in the developing world, as in so many viruses. Uh, you know, not so much. Um, and here's the reason. So hepatitis A. So if you think about what viruses try to do, again, all viruses try to do is infect organisms and get that organism to make them produce a whole bunch of viruses. So in a sense, viruses making you sick is not really helpful because the virus needs the organism it invades. So if the person falls over dead from the infection, that's not too useful to the virus. Okay? So hepatitis A virus probably historically has always infected very young. So if you're zero to two years of age and you get the virus, only 16% of the time will you get sick. Okay? So that means 84% of the time you have no symptoms at all. You still pass the virus on to somebody else. You're still infectious, but you got no problems. As you get older, and when you get five years of age and older, and particularly for adults, the vast majority of adults have, have symptoms, okay? So up to, up to 97%, depending on the study. For those people, over half of them get icteric. They get jaundice. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But basically, jaundice is not just disease, but bad hepatitis A disease, okay? So many viruses, many illnesses make kids way sicker than adults. Hepatitis A is the opposite. Kids don't get much sick from hepatitis A. So around the world, the disease is endemic, or the virus is endemic, probably is a better way to, to put it. Right? Uh, sanitation issues in the developing world, as with so many infections, is a problem. But 90% of people, by the time they're 10 years of age, they've acquired this virus, and most of them by the time they're two or three. Very few people become significantly ill. Outbreaks of hepatitis A reported in the part of the world. We just don't see it too much. In the developed world, for a long time, we were kind of in the right in the middle of the mess, which is our sanitation was a bit better. So we kept everybody from getting sick by the time they were two or three. But the virus still circulated around, so a whole bunch of people got it when they were older, when they were more likely to get seriously ill. So in the United States, if you look in the last 30 years, we've had a lot more problems with outbreaks of hepatitis A than other parts of the world. Now, admittedly, the other issue in the other parts of the world is having a public health infrastructure to count cases, to identify and to treat them all. I mean, that's, that's another issue. But the real reality is that an awful lot more people in, in the developed world who get this virus get sick than other places. So the illness itself, okay, there's, there's the illness, the pre-illness, and then there's the jaundice disease, right? So pre-illness, the prodrome, so it's about one to seven days, and people get a little bit sick, they got nausea and vomiting, they get fever less than half the time. Fatigue, they feel miserable, you know, so it's, a, it's an illness that makes you feel pretty bad. Belly pain, chills, uh, arthritis, arthralgias, joint pains, you know, all that stuff is pretty dang common, we certainly see that. But the truth is, an awful lot of viruses give you those symptoms. So for the first week, you, you go to your doctor and your doctor say, eh, you probably got a GI bug, come and see me if you're not in bad place. So even at that time, though, if you do blood tests, and most of the time people don't get blood tests because they've got nausea and vomiting, and doctors see nausea and vomiting all day, and they don't pay much attention to it. Uh, you know, there are a couple things that's already happening. One is your uh, aspartate aminotransferase, your AST, and your alanine aminotransferase, ALTs. Those are two enzymes, and if you check people's blood levels, or even early on in hepatitis A, their levels of these enzymes are going up. These enzymes exist in liver cells, okay? And they, the fact that these enzymes are being dumped by itself doesn't mean a whole lot. The big thing that it tells you is these enzymes sit in liver cells. When you find more of them in your blood, that means cells are dying and dumping these, these enzymes into your bloodstream. And so that's a quick, easy way to recognize that hepatitis of any kind is going on. We look for your serum to say, are these enzymes in your blood? If those levels are rising, then that tells you that probably that person's liver is being affected by whatever infection is going on. Okay. First thing you see uh, for someone who has symptoms who makes them, generally makes them go see the doctor pretty, pretty quickly is they get dark urine. Coca-Cola colored urine is the, is the classic story, okay? Which, if you think for all of us, would probably make us go call our doctor and say, what's going on? Uh, the other thing that happens is you get pale or clay colored stools. So you, you get uh, not dark co colored poop, you get stools that are lighter colored. And I'll talk a little bit about those in a second. Uh, and you get yellow discoloration of your skin and your sclera. Uh, illness lasts about seven days, about a week. Um, in the United States, about a third of people get hospitalized, so it makes you feel bad, okay? 
um, itching happen, happening actually with jaundice is one of the side effects of, of jaundice, and it happens about half the time. It's pretty bad uh, when people have it. Okay. Now, uh, jaundice. So, uh, I, a couple of things I'll tell you about it is that as a physician, uh, you, you don't see a whole bunch of people come in jaundice. Occasionally you do, but you miss it the first time because, I mean, supposing you were looking at this person and you hadn't seen them before. This person is jaundice. How yellow is her skin? I don't, I don't see her every day, you know. Uh, the big thing for us is a look at the eyes. So if your eyes, if you have uh, hepatitis, if you have jaundice, your yellow sclera are the big thing that really comes up for people. You know, and again, you know, with a normal person versus jaundice, yeah, I can see the difference, but a lot of times the patients are wanting to come in and tells us, and they say, I, I, I think my husband's yellow. Okay, we can test, you know, to find out that that's, but if you believe that, and I must say that, uh, in particular for African American patients who are dark, darker complected, it really becomes a, a little bit more difficult to tell. So what's going on when you when you become jaundice? Okay, so your serum bilirubin levels go up, and bilirubin is the thing, is the chemical that makes you jaundice. Now, the your bilirubin starts out from hemoglobin, so hemoglobin, your erythrocytes, and your red blood cells. Okay, all of your red blood cells they last about four months, and then your spleen carries them out, of, collects them as they get older and decrepit, they stop working so well, and the spleen breaks down some of the material. One of the materials is bilirubin. Bilirubin is part of your hemoglobin, you know, so the, the molecule that carries around your oxygen. So bilirubin is broken down from the hemoglobin. The he, the bilirubin is then taken to your liver, and your liver's job generally is to clean out the toxins of your blood, right? And one of the toxins its job is to clean out is, is bilirubin. If your liver's not working right, the cells are not working right, and the transportation through it throughout your liver is not working right, then things go astray. That bilirubin usually gets conjugated, it gets sent into your intestinal tract, and you poop it out, okay? So when it doesn't happen, then your poop stops looking as brown, because that bilirubin is not getting down into your stool, and that's one of the things that gives the stool the color. The other problem is the bilirubin, usually it goes through your intestinal tract, but if things back up, so to speak, in your liver, then it stays in your bloodstream and it goes into your kidneys. Your kidneys are another organ that cleans out your, uh, your blood and if you have enough bilirubin, the, lip, the kidney kind of gets overwhelmed, starts leaking it out in your, in your urine. So that's why one of the first things you see is Coca-Cola colored urine. You're seeing the bilirubin being leaked out, okay? Um, you know, so how many people get real bad sick with hepatitis A, okay? And our term for it is fulminant hepatitis A. It sounds bad, and it is. Uh, so about 10 to 20 percent of people who are hospitalized get that. But again, that's 10 to 20 percent. But only a minority of people who get illness get hospitalized. In hospitalized cases, less than 1.5 percent of people will die. So you know, dying of hepatitis A, can it happen? Yeah. Does it happen? Not much. Okay? It's it's pretty unusual. The one big thing to realize about your liver, okay, is as long as you have enough liver cells continuing to work, you're okay. But repeated infections, repeated toxicity, repeated issues eventually overwhelm your liver. So if you have chronic liver issues, you've had, for example, you have a drinking problem, so you have drinking-associated liver disease, or chronic liver disease like that, you've already got a liver that isn't perfectly tuned up. Those people are far more likely to have serious disease with hepatitis A. People are older, they tend to be more symptomatic and they have to tend to have disease more often as well. Okay. Can I ask Yes. So Yeah, and the question is, do uh, persons in, in areas where the disease, where the virus is endemic, do they frequently have, more frequently have fulminant liver disease, in particular, if they have underlying other medical issues? It happens, but it becomes very unusual just because even people who have chronic liver disease in that part of the world, they have most of the time, 90% plus, they've experienced it in childhood before they develop that chronic liver disease. And that antibody seems to work long term. Uh, so even for that population, we just don't see it a huge amount. It probably happens and it's missed sometimes, but it's not a huge problem. So this is a, this is a, a histologic picture of, of, a, of 
uh, close up of a liver, and don't worry, I can't quite figure out what's going on in there. So I just felt like I should have a picture of the liver in the pathology. But these are these are the hepatocytes, the liver cells. Okay, well, we've been there. You have some sludgy, and you have some red blood cells in the, in the vasculature as well. Uh, if, if you compare this to a regular liver uh, pathology, essentially you have more irregular cells because there's irritation, there's hepatitis, uh, inflammation of those liver cells. So what's interesting about liver cells, okay, so as I mentioned, hepatitis, what does it do? Hepatitis A, it kills off liver cells, okay, so necrosis, death of those cells. So when you do pathology one, there's some necrosis, there's a little bit of regeneration, so the, your body can produce a few more cells, but mostly when they die off, you kind of lose them. Uh, so when they find the virus, it's usually inside cells. When it's inside cells, those, those cells act just fine. So one peculiarity of hepatitis A is it's not the virus itself that makes you sick. You can be infected with the virus and it gets into your liver cells, okay, that's fine. It's your body's immune response. You know, it's, a, it's the, the old line of, you know, the, the cure is worse than the disease. Your body's immune response getting rid of the virus is the problem and the issue. That's when you become symptomatic and that's when you have problems, okay? And so if you look at, you know, you graph it out, so you first get the virus, the virus invades your liver cells and your intestinal tract. Right away, early on, you start, you can start testing for that virus and finding it in your stool, and that's how you pass it on, right? But you're not really sick, so the symptoms, the, the blue bar, happen after you've been shedding it in the stool, and that happens when your body's antibodies show up. So. For, for those of you who look, that have studied immunology, your IgM is generally your first antibody that shows up to the scene to fight off any particular infection. So your hepatitis A IgM shows up first. Hepatitis uh, A IgG shows up later. Hep IgM, hepatitis A, and all IgMs, they tend to go away. They hang around for a few months and then they go away. But IgG shows up later but lasts long term. Okay? Those events happen after and the symptoms that go along with it because your immune system represented by the IgG and IgM, that fighting off, that's what makes you feel sick and feel miserable. But meanwhile, you've been shedding the virus merrily, going about your day for a while, okay? And that's our problem, right? This is, this is one reason why hepatitis A is very good at its job. What's its job? To move from organism to organism, infecting people so that there are more hepatitis A in the world. The reason it's so good at its job is by the time you get sick, it's usually been a couple of weeks, at least, that you've been most infectious. So if you work at Denny's flipping burgers and you get sick with hepatitis A, that means the whole two weeks where you've been working there and not symptomatic before that, you're quite likely infectious and it's possible you could pass on the virus. That's a problem for us. By the time you've been, you've been jaundiced for about a week, you're just not about non-infectious. The antibody kicks in, it starts killing off the virus in your bloodstream and in your intestinal tract, and you're just not infectious too much anymore. Uh, when we look for the virus and we look for RNA in the, in the stool, we can find it for months afterwards. You probably still shed it for a long period of time, but it's really that you're much less infectious by that point. It's really those couple of weeks when we see the virus passed on to other people. Okay, so the fecal oral route, right? So just to make sure we're all on the same page. Poop hands to somebody else's mouth, right? That's how it gets passed on, fecal oral, okay? So that means that if you have hepatitis A and you go to the bathroom and you do not wash your hands and then you decide to go to a potluck and share with everybody else, that is how the virus is passed around, okay? Now, how does that happen? Well, okay, so outbreaks happen, but they're not tremendously common in terms of food, okay? Um, most of the time, it's associated with, with an infected food handler. So in other words, we always, this Costco thing is kind of a variation, it's kind of weird, because we see foodborne, food source outbreaks all the time, but mostly what it is, is someone has hepatitis A, they are working at some place, high-end restaurant, low-end restaurant, they are serving food right at that point. You know, They are giving food to the person or they are preparing food right at the restaurant. That's the place where hepatitis A shows up most and gets and gets passed along. If you look at the kinds of foods, basically every kind of food 
uh, can be a source of the outbreak. The one big thing is that if you cook food, that gets rid of hepatitis A. So non-cooked food, you know, pastries and salads and such, that's the best way for the virus to get passed around. Shellfish outbreaks were once terribly common. The, the largest known hepatitis A outbreak happened in the 70s uh, in, in the Shanghai area. 300,000 people got sick from eating clams that were produced at a specific, uh, at a specific site off the coast of China. Uh, so that's probably our biggest known outbreak. I, I will say that, so water can be a source of outbreak, but that hasn't happened in the, since the 1980s. And you know, our history, our ability to understand hepatitis A is a little limited by the fact that you know, 30 or 40 years ago, they didn't, we didn't have the antibody test. So hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, when we saw outbreaks all over, it was a little bit hard to tell them all apart, what was making all the people sick. Um, but we certainly know that it's less common than it, than it used to be for sure. So back to hepatitis, to, the, to our outbreak. So FDA and the CDC worked together in the way that FDA and CDC worked together, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, the best guess we have is that the virus came from a common shipment of pomegranate seeds that were part of that mixed berry uh, concoction. So right now the FDA has been retaining any shipments of pomegranate seeds, but Gochner, the, the producer of it, has voluntarily, voluntarily stopped producing it. So it was used, these pomegranate seeds were used in several uh, different concoctions, several different kinds of foods, and there really was no known issue associated with these pomegranates before this event. And looking back, the FDA really didn't, hasn't found anything thus far at the site that's a problem. Um, so, you know, going back to the virus. So, it's quite stable in the environment. Um, if you treat it with quaternary means, it's not uh, necessarily killed really easily. So, you kind of have to be aggressive. Bleach is the thing that tends to kill the virus pretty darn consistently. And that's one of the reasons this virus passes well and can be associated with foodborne outbreaks. It can survive on food for a period time even if it's sent someplace else. If you cook it 85, 95 degrees Celsius for one minute, it kills the virus. And so cooked foods, uh, unless the person who's giving you the food that's already cooked has it on their hands, cooked foods are much less of a problem, much less of a concern. So for us, when do we worry about hepatitis A or when do we see it? International travel. So people who travel to endemic areas by far uh, are an issue. One of the things we've realized recently is who gets adopted? Young kids. How common is hepatitis A in adopted kids? pretty common, and so we will certainly see in adoption clinics a fair number of children who have hepatitis A, and so having a low threshold to check them for hepatitis A is the standards of practice. Um, men who have sex with men. So this specific population certainly has been associated uh, with outbreaks of hepatitis A. Uh, injection and non-injection drugs. So I told you BNC were classically injection, non-injection drugs, IV drug user passed around. But we've seen it in injection and non-injection drug of populations as well. It's not totally clear exactly why it's being passed around. It does. It seems to be just simply issues of hygiene of people not taking good care of their needles, and so the needles get infected right at the spot, and so when they inject in the skin, they're, they're putting the virus into the bloodstream uh, and, and onto the skin as well. Uh, people with body factor disorders, basically these are people who've received a lot of times of transfusions and that raises their risk. Body factor disorder persons, uh, hemophiliacs are the classic. It, that has become really rare in the last 20 or 25 years, but it certainly has happened more often previously. So if you work with non-human primates who can carry the virus, and in research settings, hepatitis A exposure also happens as well. So these are the groups where we say from a public health standpoint, we don't see it much, but we're more likely to see it. Question? Yes. And when you have sex with men, yep. it's not It, it is more likely having habits that lead to fecal oral passage. Yeah, but it, that's a, a good question. So, um, uh, and I'll go back to the, to the MSM population. I will say that some of the outbreaks they've seen, they have looked at specific habits, uh, anal to anal, oral to anal sex, and there have been association with oral to anal sex in terms of passage, in terms of sexual habits. Sometimes that's happened with some outbreaks, not with other outbreaks. So it's not completely clear, but uh, assumedly the sexual activity of some sort of source is, is the reason for the problem. So in children, so going back to kids, how often do kids get sick with hepatitis A? A lot less common. So in the United States, if you decided that you wanted to spread, spread hepatitis A around 
Because, you know, a community, what would you invent? You would invent a daycare, right? It's just perfect, right? It does its job very well. And so, you know, kids all get together, they hang out together all day long, they drool on each other, they drool on stuff, and then they put the stuff in each other's mouth, and then they don't get sick. So, you know, before the vaccine, I'll talk about the vaccine a little bit, one of the biggest problems we had was, was child care outbreaks. But we wouldn't figure it out because a bunch of kids were getting sick, but we would, we would figure it out because they'd take it home and a bunch of families who were associated with a common daycare center would say, mom and dad uh, are often getting sick. And so uh, it's one of the reasons why tracing the virus can be difficult. Even in the United States, the passage of the virus asymptomatically from kid to kid to kid is one of the ways to get uh, and again, the MSM population uh, has been a source of epidemics. I, you know, the, the, the zero positivity, depending on the population, you know, you look at, you do antibody tests to say, do they have hepatitis A, IgG? Meaning, have they ever been exposed to hepatitis A in their life? Those percentage of people being positive in the MSM population is not necessarily all that much higher. So it's not like they have a rip-roaring, you know, 20 you know, percent higher rate of disease or 10 times higher. We just see outbreaks happen in that population a bit more. Um, again, you know, uh, injection drug users, they have a higher seropositivity rate, but again, you know, the, the, the exact reason of transmission, whether it's through continuous or fecal oral or just hygiene issues generally, is not totally understood, but we've seen it around the world. Okay, so uh, thing to mention about genotypes, okay? So just generally, Viruses that have different genotypes can pose a specific issue. Influenza virus, for example. Every year, slightly different genotype. That's one of the reasons why every year we can have a new flu season, because the virus is genetically somewhat different, it's somewhat immunologically different, our immune system doesn't recognize it as quite the same. Genetically for hepatitis A, it's really not terribly so. There are four different genotypes that exist, but if you're immune to one, you're pretty much immune to them all. Genotyping is interest for us, and we've really been able to use it in the last 10 or 15 years in public health, this is the us I'm referring to, because it, it allows us to figure out exactly where these viruses are coming from and gives you a sense of maybe where the infection started at. So uh, the outbreak strain is genotype 1B. Um, you know, so uh, of all these cases that have happened nationally, I'll talk about the numbers totally, we, they were able to serologically test, test their blood and they found this genotype specifically in 56 of the cases who have been associated with this, with this outbreak, okay? The virus hangs around for a long time, for, for, for 79 days, for, so for months, and we found it in a couple of our patients uh, here as well. So why do we care about that? Well, genotype 1B is probably seen in the United States. We just don't see, and, 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 uh, and all of uh, New world, so to speak, North and South America. We just very rarely see it. And, and so South America, we see a lot of hepatitis A, but this genotype is extraordinarily unusual. North Africa and the Middle East is where this virus is seen. Um, there have been a couple of outbreaks that have been associated with berries coming from uh, that part of the world in British Columbia and in Europe. Genetically, this virus seems even a little different than those, so this is all one big outbreak. But you know, when we're saying that we think it's from Turkey and, and it's associated with those berries, really what the CDC is saying it is from a genotype that has been found in that part of the world. And so the other parts of that berry blend, they all come from generally from South America or from, or from the United States. And so that genotype coming from that part of the world, what's the one thing in that berry blend that comes from North Africa? Uh, it's, it's the, uh, or, or from uh, the Middle East, it's the pomegranates. And that's really the reason why they're So uh, a couple of things that are just, that are just sort, of, sort of peculiar. One is I have a picture up here for a reason. So when we called our people, originally, originally we had three cases, and we said, did, do you work eat at Costco? And everybody says, yeah, yeah, I bought something from Costco. And we said, well, did you buy berry stuff? Yeah, yeah. Well, did you buy the berry blend? We said, no, no, that's not right. And then we put it on our website. We called them back and said, okay, go look at that picture. Is that what you bought? They said, ah, yeah, that's what we bought. So this is one of the things that happens with, uh, if you ever get into this line of work, you will realize people aren't necessarily lying. Sometimes they are, but sometimes they just think they don't darn well remember. And for all of us, you know, I can't remember where my car keys are. And so if you ask me what it was I ate, I kind of remember, but a picture always helps an awful lot. Uh, the FDA has begun testing these products. 
Uh, so far, they haven't had any positive of these uh, results that the FDA has reported to us, uh, you know, on a national level. You know, I will say, I, you know, again, uh, as I mentioned, re-interviewing people sort of jog their memories. Uh, you know, the world is what it is, and so we asked all these people who have their, if you have any of the berries left over, can you give them to us so we can take it to the FDA, and the FDA can test it. And they said, nah, we talked to our attorneys, and our attorneys say we should hold on to our berries to prove that there are some things to So trying to get them uh, to, uh, to turn in their berries, and it's not necessarily been the simplest thing to do. So far, the FDA has tested a lot of these berries, and they haven't found the genotype. So what you'd love to have is the smoking gun, right? You would love to find that pomegranate, or even in the mixed berry you know, concoction itself, uh, but they haven't been able to find the virus. It's not tremendously surprising because nobody's exactly sure what the best way is to try and isolate this virus. Hepatitis A virus is kind of finicky. Uh, so we can't grow the virus. We can't just take a stool sample from some from culture and have the virus grow. It just doesn't survive well outside of, uh, outside of cells. I mean, it, it survives in the environment, but we don't culture it well at all. And so they haven't been able to find the virus, but uh, fortunately or unfortunately, that's not terribly, terribly surprising. So Costco. So working with Costco is kind of interesting. Okay, so Costco is, you know, I mean, I don't stop shop at Costco, and I find it all a bit Orwellian. That so, you know, whatever you buy, they know about it, right? Because you got a Costco card, so they got your history. So they knew everybody who had purchased that item, that thousand berry blend, which was really good. That's that's very helpful. Uh, locally, our environmental health division, by the way, one of our responsibilities is to go to all the stores locally and say, have you gotten the news and have you removed this product? So that's one of the things we did. Uh, the other wonderful thing that, that Costco does is Costco has pharmacies and they offered hepatitis A vaccine when it was indicated, and I'll talk about that a little bit. And that was really helpful as well, too. So they knew who the people were and they could, they could even try and vaccinate their own clients uh, if they needed it. Uh, but it is, it's tough. Um, Costco sent both phone and mail messages, uh, but they kind of said the wrong thing. They basically told people, if you're sick, go see your doctor. Well, from a public health standpoint, I feel bad when people are sick. And if you're sick, I want you to go see your doctor and get sick. But my biggest thing is trying to keep more people from getting sick later on. And we can do that in ways I'll talk about in a little bit. So communication and information was sort of a problem. And all the information flowed from the national level. So we called the local stores and said, hey, this is what we think you should tell people. And they said, we don't do that. We wait until Costco tells us uh, from a national level what it is we're supposed to tell people. We don't pay attention to local public health. So, and you know, it gets confusing because so Costco would, would oh, I, I left out. So Costco would talk to the FDA, I'm sorry, and who would talk to the CDC. Okay, so the FDA and the CDC, uh, they, don't, they don't like each other too much. Okay, and nobody talks about this case. Because the CDC, what the CDC, that's public health. That's the national public health entity. Right? So national level CDC, then there's the state health departments, then the local health departments. And to some degree, there's a hierarchy that goes down there. All CDC cares about really is identifying outbreaks and doing something about it. That's what they get paid to do. The FDA gets paid for regulating entities. And so they get paid for, and one of their responsibilities is interacting with all of these entities, including telling them you can't produce this product anymore, or identifying that you are the source of the problem. So the FDA is extremely careful about the information that they were, they're so careful, I couldn't even put them on this slide. I'm just kidding, I forgot to put them on this slide. So, but, so the FDA would get information from Costco, and then CDC would call FDA and say, okay, tell us what you know. How many people have gotten sick? How many people do you have recorded this? And they'd say, you really need to know? And the CDC would say, yeah, we really need to know. And they'd say, well, we'll think about it. And so over a period of time, CDC and FDA and getting information quickly from them in a, in a in a quick fashion is just a continued issue that happens every time the CDC works with the FDA on events like this. I must say, Costco for themselves were generally very helpful with us. They tried very hard uh, to get information out to their clients because, again, Costco is ginormous. This one event, the only way Costco really gets in trouble is if they have the sense, their clients have the sense, the people who work, who shop there have the sense that they're not trying to help them out when they know there's a problem. So Costco was very comfortable working with people, with the CDC and the FDA have issues. But, and again, I you know, mentioned just generally, CDC gathers information, instead of California to public, public Health who sends information on to us. I mean, then obviously the information also goes back. When we gather information about our cases, we send it to the state health department who sends it on to the CDC. So our job locally, 
okay? Educating people who are concerned. So uh, we got somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 calls from people who called in to say, I ate this stuff, or I thought I ate this stuff, or I've eaten this stuff a lot, or it's in my freezer, what should I do about it? Okay. Um, we provide vaccine, vaccine or immune globulin to person who had consumed the product within the last two weeks. So that's a big part for us about hepatitis A. We can give you vaccine or immune globulin to keep you from getting sick. There are some illnesses like salmonella, for example. If we have an outbreak and people call us, we say, well, if you get symptoms, go see your doctor and you can treat it, but you can't really prevent it. Hepatitis A, if you have been exposed within the last couple of weeks, we can treat you and keep you from getting sick. Um, and you know, so following up on all the people who are ill and making sure that the people who are close contacts around them get treated appropriately is important for these reasons. So if you go back to the pre-vaccine area, 20, you're at 22 to 36,000 cases reported in our country nationally. And again, we're just kind of in that brutal in between. The, high, the hygiene practice, the sanitation in this country is good enough that not everybody got exposed to hepatitis A by the time they're old. But we certainly weren't good enough to eliminate the virus. So thousands and thousands of people would get sick and seriously ill, particularly older people. And you know, do you, do you die from it? No. On an average, they lost 33 days from work by the time all of those symptoms resolved. And so it's, it's, it's a bear. Um, in terms of uh, vaccines, so there are three different kinds of vaccines, Havrix and Vecta. Those are two vaccines that are essentially uh, just hepatitis A. Twin Ricks give you hepatitis A and hepatitis B coverage uh, as well. And so a lot of times we recommend people get the for twin to cover both sides. So it's a kill vaccine, okay? So, you know, like when flu, I got the flu vaccine and then I got the flu. No, you can't do that. It doesn't work that way because it's pieces of the virus. It's not the virus itself. And so hepatitis A vaccine, it's a shot of pieces of the virus that are grown in fibroblast cultures and then denatured, they're, they're killed. Uh, aluminum is very frequently added to a lot of vaccines and it's added to hepatitis A vaccine because it, it boosts your immune response. For a little bit of antigen, a little bit of killed hepatitis A virus, you add aluminum, your immune response is, uh, is more effective. So how do we know if a vaccine works, okay? So there's two ways you figure it out. One, the best way is you give a vaccine in the community and the, vi the vaccine the illness goes away, right? Uh, the, the way we often use as a surrogate beforehand, because it's hard to, you know, to give an entire community, you know, in Orange County, you've got 3 million people. You can't give out 3 million doses of hepatitis A vaccine and then say, hey, does it work or not? People don't appreciate that. So what we do usually is we give a certain number of people, and nowadays it's usually 10 to 40,000 people. We vaccinate them, and then we look to see if they have an immune response to the vaccine antibody that happens after that immune, after that vaccination, that's the biggest way to look at uh, how a vaccine works. If you look at seroconversion, antibody response, it's a, hepatitis A vaccine is proving to be a wonderful vaccine. Even one dose, 97% of the time you're covered. You give people two doses, so they're essentially covered 100% of the time. So pretty much always you have an antibody response. And if you look at disease in this, in this country, so uh, from 1990 to 2004, if you look at virtually all populations, but uh, you know the, the, the total number of cases have simply gone down and gone away, virtually, uh, virtually in all races and ethnicities. If you look in California and Orange County, you know the vaccine was licensed. The ACIP recommend, recommended the vaccine. It was embraced by California at that time, and the, the numbers have simply gone away. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's just been a fantastic uh, uh, vaccine for us. And, and breakdown by different age groups in, in Orange County. Again, the disease is just, you just don't see it much uh, other than if you have trouble. So, you know, initially hepatitis A, like a lot of things, so the advisory community, uh, the advisory committee of immunization practices from the CDC, they're the people who make up the rules for the uh, They established rules for CDC. Um, initially, they said, well, let's try to get high-risk kids in communities with high rates of disease, and then they expanded that to states in 1999. If you have states where you have a lot of disease, vaccinate all those kids. And finally, in 2006, they said, this is a great vaccine, but we're still seeing hepatitis A. So every kid in the country get vaccinated, okay? So um, in terms of safety, your arm hurts, which happens a lot with vaccines. But, but other than that, really bad side injections or systemic illness just doesn't happen. The virus, the vaccine has been incredibly safe uh, in addition to being effective. So now every kid a year of age gets hepatitis A vaccination. 
Okay, that's the standard of practice in CDC. Um, we have specific groups. If you look at, you know, international adoptees, if you're an older person who's, you know, didn't get the vaccine when you're young, MSM populations, uh, IV drug users, you know, the, the groups that we talked about before, all those people get the vaccine. But the truth of the matter is that anybody who wants it, we recommend get the vaccine. It is a safe and tremendously effective vaccine. People we don't recommend, so everybody who works in a school or all food handlers. The virus isn't around tremendously common, and even for food handlers, we don't see that many outbreaks. So you don't have to get a vaccine in order to do this kind of work. Is it a good thing? Sure. Is it something we standardly say, hey, you really have to get that to be able to, to work in these situations? Okay, so you can get the vaccine when you're young, when you're one, and the, the immunity seems to last at least 25 years and maybe lifelong, which is fantastic. So the immunity lasts a long, long time. But the other beauty is after you've been exposed, as I mentioned earlier, you can get hepatitis A and keep people from getting sick. So if you live in the same household where someone has hepatitis A, your chance of getting hepatitis A is pretty good. No matter how good the hygiene is, you're sharing the same bathroom, you're saying the same utensils, it becomes a problem. And so if you are known also to have some sort of food exposure uh, with someone who's, who's had hepatitis A, or sexual contact, or if you live, work, or are in a, uh, a child care center, all of those kids and the workers there should get uh, hepatitis A vaccination, if, if you have if you have enough. So what we used to do is give people something called immune globulin, right? Immune globulin is simply pooled amounts of human antibody. And some of that antibody is hepatitis A antibody. So the immune globulin product that's not really made just for hepatitis A, we're given to people at 90, 80 to 90% of the time. You give it to them within two weeks, people would not get sick. And so it, it lowered your rates of disease by 80 to 90%. It's been fantastic. Um, but, you know, just to give you a feel about what we've done and, and, and what, what we can do in terms of studying these sorts of issues. So in Kazakhstan, uh, there's areas that have some hepatitis A, a, a bit like the United States 30 years ago. Not everybody got sick by the time they were two, but there were a lot of outbreaks. And what they started doing was giving vaccine to people who were two to 40 years of age. So young, healthy people whose immune response is probably pretty good, and said, okay, if we vaccinate you or give you immune globulin, which one's better, or is there a difference? And so one to one, they gave you know if you if you got exposed to someone with hepatitis A, we'd give you immune globulin or a vaccine. You'll do it half the time one, half the time the other. Um, and what they found is that yeah, if you got the vaccine, you had slightly higher rates of illness than the immune globulin group, but that wasn't even terribly st uh, statistically significant to the confidence interval past one. Uh, but maybe it was a little more likely. But overall. If the immune globulin was 90% uh, efficacious, the, the, the vaccination was 86% efficacious. So pretty much darn near the same. So uh, one of the uh, beautiful things, and there's, there's a lot here, but I'll, ba but I'll basically tell you what it is, is the CDC that, says that everybody two, one to 40 years of age, if you get exposed, we don't have to give you immune globulin, which is real expensive and hard to get a hold of. We can just vaccinate you. You'll be protected at that time from getting sick, and then you have lifelong protection, which immune globulin can't do. So it's been a wonderful advance for us. That means that all those people who got uh, exposed to hepatitis A in this outbreak, most of them we vaccinated as opposed to giving them immune globulin. Immune globulin, again, it's very expensive and it's hard to get to around the country because it's a blood product that has to be given. So again, you know, who, who would you think? So the, as I mentioned before, the immune globulin's maybe a little bit better than the vaccine. So if you are someone who's at particular risk for doing badly, someone who has an immune problem, or if you have bad liver disease, we still give those groups immune globulin. But otherwise, healthy people generally we tend to give the vaccine. Um, so how do you treat hepatitis A? Supportive care, which in medicine is a euphemism for saying we don't have a specific way to treat it. We just try to help you out as much as we can. Okay, um, people who are. Uh, hospitalized as a general rule, making sure that they're well hydrated is an issue, and then hopefully your liver does not fail. If it does fail, eventually those people need liver transplant, but that's very uncommon. Most of the time it's IV fluids and hopefully they don't fail. So as of September 20th, 162 cases have happened in this event nationally. Uh, nine cases have happened in Orange County. Um, all who uh, ate this product got it from Costco markets. I mentioned that the, you know, there are a bunch of other uh, uh, issues that they, they recalled the product. 
But really, it was only the product from Costco that made people sick. It's not totally clear why the pomegranate and all the other products didn't make anybody else sick, but that really didn't do that. If you look at the epi curve, so, um, you know, we're seeing definitely far fewer cases. One of the problems you have is the incubation period is long, right? And the other problem is that the virus seems to last pretty well in cold situations. So we assume there are people in this country who have these poison, poison berry blend, this frozen berry blend, uh, you know, in their refrigerator, and they're going to keep pulling it out, you know, so for the next two or three years, if people got sick, we're going to have to ask them, did you happen to, you know, pull a frozen berry blend out of your refrigerator? You know, so, uh, you know, we're certainly seeing far fewer numbers, but there is some reason to believe that we'll see sporadic cases. So, and again, you know, Wisconsin had a couple of cases, but they both traveled to California. So really it's all our fault out here. Uh, and that's where the cost came from. Uh, for people who are sick, young and old, young kids don't eat these berry blend stuff. It's really older people who get, who, who, who tend to eat this stuff. Now, again, you also add in the fact that kids don't tend to be symptomatic, but, uh, you know, all, of all of these, uh, uh, Illnesses, only eight of them were kids who were, who were under 18 years of age. Um, and actually, I should update the illness. It's, it's gone into uh, end of July, we've seen cases. Nobody has died from it, but half of the identified cases, or 43% have been hospitalized. So it makes you sick, no doubt, no doubt about it. For us, nine total cases, just about all of them adults. Um, we really haven't seen anything since June. Uh, only one of them was hospitalized, so, so we really didn't see uh, terribly severe. I'll go ahead and stop there.